Hello, welcome to part three. Here we're combining dilations and translations and reflections. And the big idea is that the order in which we do it really does matter. And there's some flexibility which you'll learn about, but um, I wish that. But the order in which we do it does matter. So what is the order we want to use? So imagine that g of x equals f of 2x plus 1. So here we have a bunch of stuff going on with our horizontal um, transformations. We have a translation and a dilation. Translation and dilation. The, the question is, what order do, do we do it in? Do we dilate and translate or translate and dilate? Because if you try it out, doing it in different orders will actually lead you to different results. So let's get to it f of x equals the square root of x in this case, all right? And I'm telling you here that you might expect it to be a dilation first. I just already read this statement twice of x, so by a scale factor of a half, and then a translation left by one, but that's incorrect. So let's label that. This is not the correct way, right, to transform. What is the correct way? Well, if we look at it, the only other thing we can try, I suppose, is to do the opposite. Instead of dilating first and then translating, we can translate and then dilate. So let's do it the wrong way first, and then we'll do it the right way. Let's use 4, 2 as a point. If we dilate first by a scale factor of a half, we would get on 2 here. And then we would translate left by 1 to go here, which is clearly not the point we need. Right? It's not getting there. So instead, let's try the translating first from 4 to 3. So translation first, and then that's at 3. And then we dilate it by 1 over 2, or half. And that actually gets us exactly where we need to go, which is at 1 and a half. And all of these points, if you take 9, for example, and you slide it over to the left once to get 8, and then cut that in half, you get 4. If you take 1 over here, and you slide it to the left 1 at 0, and then cut that distance from the y-axis in half, you're still at 0. And then finally, I didn't highlight that I should have, 0, 0 right here, if you shift that to the left once to negative 1 and then cut that distance in half for the y-axis, you get negative 1 here. So that's the way to do it. So in general, what we do is this. We translate. I don't need to change my pen. We translate and then dilate horizontal transformations when they're in this form right here. So when g of x equals f of ax plus b, that means we shift them, in this case, left b units when b is greater than 0, and to the right when b is less than 0, and then dilate horizontally by a scale factor of 1 over a. And then the reflection can happen before or after the dilation. So that can happen in there as well. And we'll go over that. But why does this happen? We can see it happening, what's going on, right? That's what this is all about. So one thing I found helpful is when we're dealing with horizontal transformations, you can think of this question, how would I solve for x? And all the steps you would use to solve for x are exactly the things you'll be doing to each point in terms of horizontal transformations. Everything you do to solve for x tells you how to transform uh, your function horizontally. Why is that? Well, imagine this. So first of all, we know that f of x equals the square root of x. And that means we know that f of 4 is 2. So you could ask yourself the question, when does g of x equal 2? When does that happen? So to figure that out, we know that g of x equals f of 2x plus 1. So it's the same thing as taking the inputs of g, doubling them, adding 1, and plugging them into f. And that means this, that f of 2x plus 1 at some point will equal f of 4. Right, at some point, they should have the same outputs. And if they don't, that means that we're making some incorrect assumption. Maybe there's a weird transformation in there. Um, but here, in order for this to happen, 2x plus 1 and 4 must be the same thing. That's the only way these things can be equal. 2x plus 1 has to equal 4 at some point. But the question is, what x value can we plug into g so that double of x plus 1 gets you 4? Because then we know the output is f of 4 is 2. And we're getting that same output and therefore g of x would equal 2. So I'm going to add to that chain. g of x equals f of x plus f of 2x plus 1, which equals here f of 4. We wanted to get an output of 2, and that happens in f of looking at f of 4. And now we solve for x. And look at this. If we subtract 1, we get 2x. I'm running out of room down here. Let me write over here this way. 
that means that 2x equals 4 minus 1 or 3. Now notice that the minus 1, the minus 1, let's focus on the point that we're looking at here, right? But the first thing we do is go left 1. That's the minus 1. We're solving for x. Then what did we do? We dilated by a scale factor of a half. Why? Because we use the step, steps that solve for x. So to solve for x here, we divide by 2, and x equals 1.5, which is exactly the x value we need. So when you look at 1.5, the output is 2, and that's for g of 1.5. g of 1.5 equals 2. That's the answer to our question. So those translations and transformations happen in that order. Translations first, because we'd solve for x in that way. And then what we would do is scale it by a factor of 1 half. Now, of course, you could solve for x in other ways. Um, you could do other things here. And that will actually um, correlate to the transformations we'll talk about in a little bit. But right now, let's just assume you're solving for x in a standard way. So right here, I'm just showing exactly what I showed above, and that shows you the, how the transformations work. Here, I'm explaining it in words, okay? And then here's another way to think about it. Another way to say it is that since g of x equals f of 2x plus 1, the inputs of g are multiplied by 2 and added by 1 before they will have the same outputs of f. So you have to do those two things. You have to double it and then add 1. So if you want to find the inputs of g that produce the same outputs of f, you can reverse that process. So you have to take x, double, and add 1, right? But then you have to go backwards. You have to subtract 1 and then divide it by 2. And so it's always about unraveling or solving for x inside the inputs there. And now we can look at 11 here. It says fill out the, the table below for this function. h, if h of x equals f of 1 minus 2x, and f of x equals the square root of x. Then graph h with the points that correspond to the values given in the table. All right, so... Um, here we have we want to know when does h of x equal 0, 1, 4, and 9? When does that happen? Okay, so how do we do that? Well, I didn't give you much room to write this. Sorry about that. Um, so maybe use scrap paper. So h of x equals f of 1 minus 2x, which equals, well, f of x, when does f of x equal 0? When you plug in 0. So here, that means we can figure out when does 1 minus 2x equal 0. So what I'm going to do is uh, subtract 1 on both sides and divide by negative 2. So x equals negative 1 divided by negative 2, which is 1 half. So the input is 1 half when the output is 0. And we'll talk about how that makes sense in a moment. And let's keep going. Now we want to know when does it have an output of 1. Well, let's, let's repeat the process. f of x has an output of 1, looking at square roots when the input is 1. So f of 1 equals 1. So I want to know when does f of 1 minus 2x equal f of 1. That happens when 1 minus 2x equals 1. And again, you can subtract 1 and divide by negative 2, and that's 0. So when x is 0, the output is 1. Repeat the process. OK, now we want to know when it equals 4. All right, we've got 0, 1, now 4. So h of x, which equals f of 1 minus 2x, has to some point equal 4. And that happens when, oh, you're taking the square root, when the when the input is, you know what, this should be, I apologize, this should be a 2, and this should be a 3. Now let me fix that. I could have solved it that way, but that's, that's a typo. I don't think it'll fit on the graph. So f of 4 will equal 2. That's my confusion there, confusing my inputs and outputs. So when f of 4 equals 2, um, that means h of x has some input that also gets you to 2. And that'll happen when 1 minus 2x equals 4. When does that happen? Subtract 1 on both sides and divide by negative 2. You get uh, 3 divided by negative 2 is negative 1.5. So that happens at negative 1.5. And then finally, our last input, and I'll graph it. Our last input is, um, our last output is 3. So that happens when you look at f of 9. So when I want to know when does 1 minus 2x equal 9? When does 1 minus 2x equal 9? Now that happens, subtract by 1, you get 8. Divide by negative 2 is negative 4, and that's the answer. Now, does this make a little bit of sense? Well, what are the transformations here in words? I'm going to write it this way. So negative 2x plus 1. This is telling me that I want to go left 1, 
and then I could reflect it. This is horizontally, so I could reflect it over the y-axis first, and then scale it by a half, or I could scale it by a half and then reflect it. That order won't matter. Um, so let's just trace that and see if it works. So originally, we'd be at the point zero, zero. So I want to go to the left one here, and then what do I want to do? I want to reflect it over the y-axis here, and then, so boop, and then reflect it, and then cut that distance in half here. So that makes sense that that does get us to x equals one half. And I could have done it a different way. Again, I could have, starting at zero, zero, I could have um, translated left by one, then scale it back to here by a half, and then reflect it. It gets me to the same location. It gets me to one half. It's a little sloppy. So here, our first point is at one half. Then it's at zero, one. Then it's at negative one and a half, two. And then negative four, three. And here, that's our function. And you know, you could test any one of these points to see that it works, but I hope you're getting the basic idea. Thanks.